So hopefully you can see my screen. I'm looking on the right hand side for Deborah to tell me yes. Before yes, I introduce okay. myself, I need to know kind of what I'm dealing with. I don't know you. I'm kind of encouraging to hear about this project, which I also didn't know about. So all I know is you're 18 to 35. It sounds like holidays that I used to go on when I was a lot younger. So I haven't got a pole. I haven't, I haven't got a fancy pole running or a padlet where you can stick things on, but you're welcome to, if you want to shout out any answers you know to this question. So my sons have been pond dipping in right and and not in right and ponds in the, in Brandon Marsh. My son actually fell into Brandon Marsh, had to pick him out right under. So we're quite, quite good at the invertebrates, but what are the microscopic things you find in there? I just, does anybody want to shout out and tell me things? I can see all of the, all of the, um, I can only see about three of you, so you have to actually shout out. I, I won't even know when you're not answering. You can also put some answers in the chat if you're feeling shy. Oh yeah, the chat, where's the chat? <laughs> well, I'm not I, can, I can man it if you like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not manning, I'm not manning, I can't see the chat because I'm, I only ever use Microsoft Teams in my, in my professional life. So Zoom, I'm quite, I'm a bit nervous. So what do I find in there? So Molly said tardigrades. You might find tardigrades. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, um, I wouldn't be here, would I? <laughs> Ayla has said rotifers. Rotifers, yeah. Rotifers. Rotifers are cool. Yeah. We, we would might you find? Right. Sorry, <laughs> would you find algae, or is that not microscopic? It's definitely microscopic. It can be macroscopic, as you can see it in maps on the right hand side. It looks like a whole load of moss and algae on the right hand side of that picture. So you find you find lots of things. You're guessing the right things. So. I'm kind of being a bit more specific because I don't know, you know, what level of, you might know more about this than I do, for all I know. So Isabella might, has said diatoms. Diatom, you do find diatoms. Um, yeah, look, it's in my list. Diatom, down here. Ah. Get, my, get my pen and I can, I can use a laser, can I use a laser pointer? Yes. So diatoms, <laughs> tardigrades, yes. Many arthropods, you can see crustaceans like water fleas. I've been out to, um, and and done extreme pond dipping days at Brandon Marsh where we take the microscopes and we put them by the education center there and, and get the kids to lump some of the water onto the microscopes and see what's swimming around. Of course, there's a tardigrade, a hydra, a nematode. Goodness knows what that broken thing is. It looks a bit like a bryzoan. Um, and then some copiapods and some algae. Yes, brilliant. So you know all these things. But sometimes thing, things are only single celled. What, what magnification do I need? You know, it's easy to spot a beaver. Uh, it's easy to spot a, well, it's not easy to spot a newt, but you can find them. But what magnification do I need to see a protozoa? Single-celled organism. Anybody want to answer that one in the chat? Anyone want to guess? Just guess, there's only four to guess. Doesn't matter if you get it wrong. There are no prizes. No penalties. Um, so we've got a guess of 400, 100, 100, 400. <laughs> yep, yeah, everybody knows. And the correct answer is around about 400. Yep. Yeah. Well, actually, you can see things moving at about 30 to 40 times. You can actually see them move other things. Um, but if you want to get a really good look at what's inside them, then 400 times is the sort of power you're using. So the kind of teaching microscopes you may have used at school or college or university are gonna have maybe a 20 times objective and they might have a 10 times lens. So 200 times, you can get start to get a good view um, at that voice. But if you're gonna see inside, let's have a bit more. So there's small things in there, that's what I'm just going. What can we see without a microscope? Can you see hydra? Can you see amoeba, water flea, nematode? I ought to have a voting system here. Anyone want to put in, in the chat? Any chat answers? Um, we've got flea as an answer. Anyone else? Hydra. That's the answer I was waiting for. You can see water fleas just about. Again, you can see them moving. You can see, you can't see what it is usually, but you can see it moving. Hydra are really beautiful. You know, five, 10, 15, you know, big, millimeter long animals especially when they extend to feed you can see them really easily so we've got the hydra we're going to get a bit more technical now this is where i'm testing what you know about oh, i've dropped my special 
This is actually a scalpel I've dropped here. I'll show you how to use that later. Um, which of the following is not a characteristic of an arthropod? Okay, so you have to think back to about any time you've done some, some phylogeny or classification. So do they all have segmented bodies with paired appendages? Do they all have bilateral symmetry? Do they have a heart? Got quite have... a few answers saying heart. So the heart is not a characteristic of an arthropod. So the answer is, the correct answer is C, which is the heart, but actually only sort of. Arthropods actually do have a thing, well, some arthropods have a special structure on their, just under their dorsal cuticles called the dorsal vessel. They do have an open circulatory system, a hemolymph with a hemocele where they're pumping around this fluid, but it is pumped. And what's amazing, absolutely amazing about this heart is we know the, the genes that make the hearts. So there's a gene that was discovered called, surprisingly enough, the gene is called Tin Man. And it makes hearts because if you lose the Tin Man gene, you lose your heart. So it's named after the Wizard of Oz. Tin Man genes were discovered in, a, in an insect. But the Tin Man genes also make hearts in humans. So they have the same role, insects to humans. Quite, quite an amazing thing. OK, let's get down to the business then. So are tardigrades arthropods? Are they insects? Are they nematodes? Or are they none of the above? This is really tells me what you know now. <laughs> what do you think, everyone? Uh, we've got arthropods, none of the above, arthropods, nematodes, nematodes. Right, so we got nematodes, arthropods, and none of the above. Yeah. So the answer is none of the above. Actually, none of the, but they are neither arthropods, which is nasty of me to, they do not have a dorsal vessel, but neither do many arthropods. And um, they're not really nematodes. So they belong to their own phylum. They are in the phylum tardigrada. So I'm going to get quite technical and try and answer um, some questions about that in the talk itself. But often they're most famous in the, if you go and read the Daily Mail or the Sun or the Express or so, the Guardian even, they'll call these animals extremophiles. Last question now, are they extremophiles? All you have to do is vote true or false. 50-50 chance, everyone. <laughs> There's loads of money rising on this. Okay, we've mostly got true coming out, some false, but majority true. Most majority true, the answer is false. Ah. Yeah, my proposition to you is it's actually a matter of semantics over the word. And I would say that I would judge that living somewhere is very different to surviving somewhere. So they can survive extreme environments, but they're not very good at living in extreme environments. So I would I would call them extrema tolerant and not extrema files, because there are many bacteria that are extreme files. They live there, but there are very few places of an extreme environment such as outer space, such as the moon, where a tardigrade is actually going to live. It can survive to an extent. And that's what hopefully you'll get this evening. So, oh, I thought we'd finish the questions. Last question then. What can survive an hydrobiosis? I'm not even going to tell you what the word is. What can survive an hydrobiosis out of these lot? Okay, seems like you might have to take a guess on this one, guys. And hydrobiosis. If they're not guessing, I'll tell you that anhydrobiosis means the relative lack of water. So we've got a couple of votes for tardigrades. I love a tardigrade. Um, I know someone else is. has said nematodes and seeds. Seeds are in there a couple of times. People have said seeds. I did say that many, the, actually the only one who can't really is the human. Yeah. So the, on the right here is tardigrades is one of the answers. Otherwise, again, they're of no excitement at all if they're just very small and you can't see them. And they don't do crazy things. They do do interesting things. Here, what we've got is a resurrection plant on the top right, where my pointer is, and that will live in the deserts, particularly of North America, and will can stay dry for years. Nematodes, here's an, a roundworm, a nematode, that can desiccate and dry. It can form dower stages if you know anything about the life cycle of nematodes. Tardigrades, of course, a human, 
Well, you can, as a human, you can, most of us can hold our breath for three minutes, but we need some oxygen after that. We can go for three days without water before we start to think about dying. And we may go three weeks without food. But a tardigrade, well, the longest we know is about, the longest proved is 30 years. The longest claimed is 130 years. And the actual answer we don't really know because we haven't done the experiment. So, so my name's Kevin Moffat. I'm a, a professor of biology at the School of Life Sciences, University of Warwick. I spent, I need to justify why I'm here in front of you. I've spent seven years of my life studying bacterial genetics. I worked on the effects of ultraviolet radiation on bacteria working in Australia. And then 30 years ago, I came to the University of Warwick and I, I spent all of that time pretty much working on fruit flies and insects. And in the last two years, I've been allowed, because I'm old and I'm a professor and I can kind of do a little bit of what I really want to do. I do a little bit of looking at tardigrades and I'm particularly interested in two things. One, I'm interested that nobody has really done any proper um, ecology. We don't really know where all the different ones are. We don't know if there are rare ones. We just know they're kind of uniform and kind of everywhere. And there are some differences on some sites. And the other thing I'm interested in is their microbiome. I'm quite interested in what is inside their gut. And I'll explain the reasons for that as we go. Before I tell you about tardigrades, I kind of want to tell you a story. So this is a story from just a couple of years ago. The story is April the 19th, uh, no, April the 11th, I haven't got my notes now, April the 11th, 2019. You have to pretend that you are the director of the, the Israeli space mission, Space IL. You're in Yehud in Israel. It's a hot evening. You're in really confident mood. Six weeks, seven weeks ago, you sent out on a SpaceX rocket, you sent up a rocket. Its planned mission is to measure, to do some measurements of the moon's magnetosphere, to land on the moon and to um, do a moon to moon relocation, to take off and land again on the moon. And you're a confident mood. You're really very confident. Because this is the first private funded mission to the moon. Everything else is by the governments, China, America, but Israel has a private enterprise. And this is the, the lunar mission. And actually the bit in the middle I'm showing you here, this is a time capsule organized by the funders of this, this project called the Arch Foundation. The Arch Foundation's primary target is to make a library of human information because it believes we need to make mankind survive somewhere else in the universe and they're going to start with the moon presumably after this week we're going to go to they're going to go to mars and they plan to land their orbiter here on the sea of serenity and everything's gone really well until seven weeks into the mission just as the ceo is thinking about his success he's going to claim how brilliant this is how what a fantastic project this is how the maths has worked but nine miles above the moon, they lose communication. One of the gyroscopes on this lander breaks. NASA found the crash site two days later. They missed the sea of serendipity, whatever it's called, serenity. <laughs> and they landed, crash landed on the sea of tranquility. They crash landed at 300 uh, kilometers per hour, splashing the debris across the surface of the moon. Now the reason I showed you that um, that time capsule is because the time capsule of course it contains very precious data for the Israelis, copies of the Torah, statements from Holocaust survivors, but debatably some things they shouldn't put in there. Human DNA in the form of blood, in the form of hair, and tardigrades, tardigrades, they put tardigrades in this flipping capsule and then they crashed it into the moon. You can have a think about the ecological um, ethics of doing that, let alone the human DNA, but an animal is on the moon. So the question is, why did they take tardigrades to the moon? And you sort of answered some of that as we've gone through that little quiz, because they can survive things like anhydrobiosis. So here's a look-see at a bunch of tardigrades. Here's the tardigrade on the left here. This is a classic scanning electron micrograph of the tardigrade in its normal state 
And in what we call this tun state, although right here is the tun state, the tun state is the state in which it can survive without water. It dehydrates into the state. This was the state the tun was in when they took it to the moon. It was actually in this state and embedded in plastic. It may be that the plastic has shattered as it hit the surface of the moon. The chances are the tardigrade, if it is at all alive, even in this state, this is what it looks like as it lies on the surface of the moon. On Earth, when they're active, these are just um, pictures taken from a typical microscope, like the one I have in my house this evening, of two different types. This is the, the most common types of terrestrial um, tardigrades. We call them limno-terrestrial because they actually require a film of water all the time. They can't walk along dry land. And this is a marine species, um, and they're beautiful species. If you look inside, this is why I asked you, was it an arthropod or was it an insect? Because it kind of looks quite like an arthropod. It looks like an insect if you look inside. So it has a ventral nerve cord here. The brain is in the head. There's a ventral nerve cord. There's a classic gonad. That's usually, at least it's always female. Some of them, in some species, we only know the females. We don't know what the males look like or whether they even exist. There are muscles, that's what these orange bands are here. There are bands of muscles around, and that's what gives the, the animal its hydrostatic pressure because there's no, you know, you don't have triceps and biceps, you have this hydrostatic pressure. It's segmented like an arthropod, like an insect. It's segmented. It has feet, although they're actually a bit more like velvet worm feet. They're, they're kind of telescopic and can go in and out. They have these stylets which pro propel the mouth parts forward and can pierce cells. So they can feed off plants, they can feed off animals, they can feed off bacteria, and some even feed off other tardigrades. So there are carnivorous and um, uh, cannibalistic tardigrades. So it looks internally very much like an arthropod. First description, long time ago, been studied longer than many, many organisms, really with the, the starts of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek and the origins of the microscope, and he discovered animacules. But the first real description came from this German pastor, a guy called Johann Goetz um, in 1773. And these are his drawings, beautiful, beautiful drawings taken from plates that he made. Um, and he called it the water bear. He thought that they were um, carnivores. So he, he kind of thought in the great world, as we lived in, there are bears who are carnivores in Germany. So we'll call these things the water bears um, in the small world. They're also called moss piglets. I've never yet found who's actually derived the name moss piglets because the name tardigrade came from the Italians a few years later. So this is uh, Lazaro Spallanzani, who's done some amazing experiments. Um, some of the most ethically dubious experiments I've ever seen done on owls and bats. If you want to ask me that question later, they are utterly disgusting, um, but that's how we know sonar works in bats. But to my mind, Spallanzani is famous for his naming of the tardigrade. Here is his drawing of the tardigrade on the bottom right here in his book on animals and plants, the mining animals and plants. And it's a truly terrible drawing compared to um, Goetz's, but he called it Il Tardigrado, Tardigrade meaning um, slow stepper in, in Latin. So he's the man responsible for the name, Spallanzani, 1776. Okay, some hardcore biology. I don't know who, uh, who amongst you have had to do hardcore um, phylogenies and learn about the, the tree of life. Um, so here is a tree of life and the first division. So the question you can see is, here's the tardigrade. It's all alone in its own phyla. It's neither related to arthropods or nematodes. And of course, we like, we're human beings, we like to put things in little packages and say, who is it closely related to? Is it closely related to a nematode or closely related to an arthropod, like a scorpion or an insect? And the first thing you see is there's a question mark, which tells you we're uncertain about this phylogeny. So we're all part. So, you know, if you, if you remember back to your, if you've done any sort of college level um, biology, then the protostomes and the deuterostomes are this division of life. When you're a bag of cells, several tens of thousands of cells, you form a thing called a... a, a, a a blast you call a blastocyst and you have a little hole in the top called a blastopore and it depends whether you make that blastopore into an anus or into a mouth first so we tend to we're down here with the frogs you did the amphibians the other day they're deuterostomes we're deuterostomes the blastopore forms an forms an anus yeah 
whereas the protostome forms the mouth. So they, the animal kingdom is divided at big time that way. There is a number of these secondary divisions. And of course, we're into this group called the ecdysozoa because the, all of these animals molt and tardigrades molt. So all of these animals molt and then come down to the phyla, the arthropods, the tardigrade, the nematodes. There are lots of others. So I'm not going to go into the others. So where is it in this phylogeny? DNA. So the morphology is not helping us. All this kind of key tree of life stuff is based on this bit looks like that, that bit looks like that, it does that, it develops this way, therefore it's more related to this. But perhaps, and traditionally now, we're getting more and more information from the sequence of DNA. And there is a number of bits of key parts of our DNA we sequence. And I'm gonna talk about the Hox genes. Now, I don't know who studied Hox genes, but I'm a fruit fly biologist. And I love Hox genes because there's famous cases of Hox gene mutations in the fruit fly. So on the left here, we have another smaller tree of life. We're down here, we're part of the tetrapods. You know, we're kind of closely related to the fish in this game. All animals have Hox genes, every single one of them. We sometimes call it the zoo type. You have to, if you can see Hox genes, you're an animal. If you're a plant, you haven't got Hox genes. You've got other genes. Hox genes pattern your body from the front to the back. And the amazing thing is, first discovered in fruit flies, hooray, um, is that the genes that organize the pattern along the front to back axis are, are linked along the chromosomes in the same way. And that turns out to be true for every animal we look at. Apart from tardigrades are a bit more mixed up as it turns out. The thing with this is you can see there's a code. These block boxes, these red to blue, are different Hox genes that pattern different parts of the animal from the front to the back. I'm not going to go through every one, but if you mutate one of them, a whole section of the animal changes what it is. So you can take a fly, it's a dipteran, it's got two wings, and you can make a mutation in one Hox gene and suddenly it's got four wings. So it's a fly, but it's got four wings, so it's not even a dipteran. Or you can actually make it have 10 legs, like a spider. So these genes are amazing controllers of our body shape identity. So people are very interested to know what's happening in tardigrades. So this is a closer look. Here's the tardigrades here. And these boxes represent different types of Hox genes that are known to regulate different parts of the animal. And here's the arthropods. And they've got this set of genes from front to back. And here's the nematodes. And what you see with the nematodes is there are certain genes missing. And amazingly, in the tardigrade, it looks like the same genes are missing. The suggestion of this is good evidence molecularly that tardigrades are much more related to, to nematodes than they are to arthropods. So they look like they're closer to the nematodes. Then something really complicated came along. It's, it's molecular biologists got really clever and they could, we know the sequences of all of the genes. We know that Drosophila has the best part of, you know, 13, 14,000 genes. We know humans have 20,000. We know tardigrades have 20,000. We know rice has 100,000. We know what all of these genes do. So we can ask a question that says, are the genes in our tardigrades, and here's two of them, more similar to the ones you find in arthropods or nematodes? And all you have to do is look at the, the, these kind of pinky bits are up here and are close to the tardigrades, whereas the blue ones are further away. And what that says is, OK, so molecularly, they kind of look like a nematodes in terms of their Hox genes. But in terms of the genes they've actually got and how they're related, it looks more like an arthropod. So for all of this DNA sequence, we actually still don't know the answer. And for those who know about DNA sequencing, they can ask me about mitochondrial and barcoding. We still don't know the answer to who is it related to. What we do know is something amazing. And that is that the first time the genome was sequenced was about 2015. The, one of the tardigrades, was, the DNA, all the DNA was sequenced and they said something amazing. They said 15%, 15% of this animal has DNA that's come from other places, from plants, from fungi, from bacteria. It has come in through a process called horizontal gene transfer. So where has this DNA come from? Another group two years later said, no, you didn't really wash your tardigrades properly. And actually all the sequences you got from the outside and actually on the inside, it's a bit different. However, this number here, this 1.2% is, 
is the, the, the horizontal gene transfer. It's taking DNA from other species in its environment. So all these things we study in, in the ecology, there's a movement of the genes between organisms, certainly from between all of these, from plants, other eukaryotes, bacteria and fungi, the genes have ended up in the tardigrade genome. How is a different matter? We can have a chat about that if you want to ask me. Can we see them in the fossil record? These are pretty small creatures, remember? The first ones were about reported about 1964 on the right, and these come from the Cretaceous period, about 140 million years ago. Um, and they're preserved in amber, and they look exactly like the tardigrades that we have today, exactly. If you go back a little further, the one from reported by Budd, um, I think it's with Gerald Budd, a couple of years ago, he found what he claims are tardigrade um, fossils from the Cambrian period. So this is 550 plus million years ago, and he's claiming you can see the legs here. I must admit, I see a, a footprint on the moon when I look at that. But he's studied this and reported this and published on this, uh, and is very convinced that this part here is a tardigrade foot, and you can see them here, and there are eight of them. I can't see the, the eighth of them. So he's claiming the tardigrade body pattern has been around pretty much straight away. As soon as we saw multicellular animals in the fossil record, we've had tardigrades in the fossil record. So they are an ancient phyla, maybe at some of the roots of the um, fossil record. Where do you find them in nature? So you find them everywhere. You find them everywhere. Actually, the one at the bottom here is Coventry. Yeah, actually, I had a, I was given permission a few years ago to go and search a number of the sites of special scientific interest for tardigrades. And actually, this is the, my best site in Coventry. I don't, does anybody know where that is? Um, it's Claybrooks Marsh, not so far away from Brandon Marsh. So it's, it's close to, uh, where would be close to Binley, somewhere like that, just off the Binley Road. Yeah, yeah, quite nearby. Great source of tardigrades, <laughs> I found my best set. And actually all the beautiful and pristine ponds and the edges of the ponds I found at Brandon Marsh, I didn't find a single tardigrade. But in Claybrooks, I found loads, which, which is quite a contaminated site actually when we looked at the, some of the contaminants, because the A45 is just the other side of these trees. But you find them in deserts. So these are lichens growing in rocks on deserts. And if you add water, so this is about half a millimeter long, this tardigrade to give you a, a sense of scale. So this is the Arizona desert, pictures taken by a guy called Bill Armstrong there. You find them in marine environments. Barnacle sand is a really popular spot to find tardigrades, but you can find them benthically at the bottom of the ocean. You can find them in intertidal zones. Um, I've spent, I've irritated my wife on many a summer holiday digging up beaches looking for tardigrades with sieves and water and getting very excited when I finally find one I've never seen before. You find them in glaciers. You find them in the Mariana Trench, but you find them at the tops of mountains. So these are things called Kraikonite holes. Um, and I'll show you some Kraikonite holes in a minute. There is one case, this guy Shinto Fujimoto um, is a kind of a Japanese hero of tardigrade hunting. And he reports the finding of one species in the hot springs in Japan, you know, where the monkeys sit, these, the David Apron shows where there's, uh, I want to call them snow monkeys, but I can't quite remember what they are. Um, those hot springs have um, tardigrades in. Nobody's, they've only ever been found once, <laughs> never been found again. So that's a bit sad. So this is the major group of tardigrades here, the Utardigrada. This is the group of organisms that, that you find as you go around sites on the land, limno-terrestrial. They are, um, oh God, I'm just gonna put the light on myself a little bit more. These beautiful drawings, these beautiful pictures come from the University of Michigan Art Gallery, um, just to show you some of that variety. Today on my roof, I found some of these. I'll show you a picture of them later. If I can find one live, I'll show it to you. But I've been looking all afternoon and I haven't found one that I've been able to keep moving all afternoon. So there are many marine species, but most of them are land species. Um, so, and uh, this species here is, is part of the heterotardigradia, but it's of the land variety. It's called Elenus, and it's down here. We, we can find those locally in Warwickshire quite easily, and you'll find lots and lots of these when you go, if, if and when you ever go looking. So that's the classification. This is my favourite source. This is a recent publication from a group in Italy who looked in glaciers. Um, so glaciers are great. I don't know if you've ever looked at moraine in glaciers, but the moraine in glaciers. Oh, there's a cup of tea coming in my door. Thank you very much. My voice is struggling. Cheers. If you look at a glacier, you find soot, 
you find algae growing and it darkens and that increases the rate the uh, effect of temperature radiation and the glaciers melt more quickly because of the soot and because of the algae and those algae are the things that um, tardigrades eat so are these there are these holes in the glaciers we call criconite holes and that's it's pretty much the only place you find where tardigrades dominate what we call the mere fauna this tiny microscopic multicellular organisms they usually don't dominate anywhere you look they're quite rare and hard to find sometimes um, ecological sites are almost frequently dominated by nematodes the most abundant multicellular organism on the planet or um uh, rotifers, somebody mentioned rotifers earlier, lots of rotifers. But criconite holes are, are one place that tardigrades can be found in abundance, particularly uh, reported in Alaska and in the Italian Alps down here, these beautiful criconite holes. There are 1300 different species. I've probably seen in my life maybe only 10 different types. <laughs> so if I'm a stamp collector, there's a long way to go. The, the beautiful forms, be absolutely stunning forms of, of organisms that you can see um, in, in the way they display, but the same eight legs, the same organization of the body plan, some that you know I wouldn't even probably recognize if, that, if I fell over it. Most of them I am gonna recognize, they look like a bit like these ones. So there's much diversity within species and there are many, many species. We think they probably originated in a marine environment, but I've not actually seen the evidence really for that argument, probably because of the, the Cambrian um, finds. How do they reproduce? Well, they reproduce mainly the ones on land with pathogen pathogenesis. They don't bother to mate. They don't bother with sexual reproduction. They just go through rounds and rounds of um, asexual reproduction, much like an aphid would. But there is sexual reproduction in some species and there are hermaphrodites in some species and in some species we only know the females two things to say here I've, we've actually taken movies of um th the females um, molting and as they molt they leave behind the eggs and quite frequently these go these then divide and become new tardigrades through pathogenesis but some of them in this case this is actually the sexual behavior where you know i don't want to go through actually what the female's doing here but she's effectively stimulating the male such that when she leaves her eggs he will actually fertilize the eggs in the cuticle case other times he lays his sperm underneath the cuticle and the sperm migrate to the ovary to fertilize so variety and you can what's what's nice what i find reassuring is how how new some of these these are this is an ancient biology you know we i live in a, a department that's doing hardcore molecular biology synthetic biology yet there are still people publishing this beautiful zoology um, and this and observations that nobody's really seen before so there's whole areas that we can study and i think this is one of my favorite photographs um, of actually these are electron micrographs of the eggs that tardigrades lay they're incredibly diverse and beautiful um, and you can see these in the environment these are taken under a scanning electron microscope so these are the eggs that are hatching out from inside a cuticle that's been left and you can see this is actually a species that we i would say hold in the lab but having been back recently the technicians thrown all my cultures out and the company that originally provided them has gone bust in the pandemic so i'm wondering where i'm going to get my toy a heart tardigrades to play with this is a hips uh, and there's lots of little baby and they go through about three molts before they mature and sometimes they lay their eggs actually inside moss so these are moss leaves little you call them leaves but they're uh, inside little bits of moss so they're hidden away so there's a beautiful uh, magazine uh, written by a lady called Janice Glim from Michigan Tech I haven't really answered this question have I why do you take tardigrades to the moon well you take tardigrades to the moon because they've previously been to space there was an experiment done by um, I can't remember if they were Swedish or Norwegian now um, they took a rocket, one of the rockets out of Kazakhstan and they fired it in space towards, and they put it onto the International Space Station and for 10 days they exposed tardigrades. Now you can, this is just the kit that was on the outside of the space station and this is the filters they used and you can just about see the tiny little bits of dust that are zoomed up in here, um, which are allegedly cold cultures then of tardigrade tons so there's not just one animal per dot that you can see there's probably many and they expose them for 10 days to the vacuum of space so this is 
you know, however cold that is, very cold, um, no, uh, no atmosphere and some radiation. And then they brought them back to Earth and rehydrated them. So they're in their ton state when they do this. And they found that nearly 70% of them survived once they rehydrated. And actually 5% of them survived when you even hit them with high levels of radiation. That's radiation that's about a thousand times what would kill us. So this is where the stories come that they're radio, you know, they're kind of resistance to radiation. They're not completely resistant to radiation. If you leave them up long enough, they will die, but they can survive a thousand times better than we can. And it turns out these states of being able to protect themselves are this state of cryptobiosis. And there's lots of forms. And hydrobiosis, where you survive um, lack of water, pressure, lack of oxygen, cryobiosis, low temperature. And of course, you can protect yourself from radiation. But they're tolerant, but still intolerant. And the classic one is freezing and dehydrating. So if you take a tardigrade, God knows what tardigrade this one is. It looks like the world's oldest tardigrade. And, it, and you take the and if you fast freeze it, um, you get big crystalline structures and the ice crystals shatter the animal. So it can't survive necessarily if it just suddenly becomes cold. It's actually a physiological process. It has to perform to survive. So it has to slowly freeze. And that's what I'm talking about there is when we've done it in the lab, that's about two to three hours of very slow. And you can do this also with um, humidity. You can take them out and then just drop the humidity of an atmosphere and they will slowly form a ton. If you just take the tardigrade out and put it into the air, it will die. You know, it, it's not the most resistant animal in the world as the papers would have you believe. So you have to take some care. There is a biological process. So, of course, people have worked, been working out what the mechanism, because it's not the only animal we talked to. Perhaps I didn't mention that, you know, that lungfish can do this, that um, um, frogs can do this, that nematodes can do this. So the big idea is that trehalose is a protective sugar. Um, and we can see that many insects and, and nematodes will use trehalose as a kind of replacement. As the water is lost, um, you put in the sugar and you can thicken the components. It will block the function, the, the formation of ice crystals and the ton will be survived. And the problem with that story is that not every tardigrade that can survive this type of uh, dehydration and, and freezing actually has trehalose in any great quantity. So it can't be trehalose. It's actually something very special, a very different mechanism in trehalose. Just, I think, um, just uh, reported just a year ago that it was actually a very unique set of proteins. So when they sequenced the tardigrade genome, about half the genes and half the proteins we've never seen before, never seen any of these proteins in the world before, 40 something percent. And a group of them are called uh, the intrinsically disordered proteins. And they just kind of don't really form a structure. But as they slow down, as they become um, viscous and they become dry, they start to line up. And actually what they form is glass, they vitrify. And this is how tardigrades, the majority of tardigrades, I'm just being careful because it's not true for all, but the majority of tardigrades um, do it by not protecting themselves with sugar as many animals do with trehalose, but with forming themselves into glass, which is pretty amazing. Um, and the biotechnology, you can see the biotechnologists in the world going, wow, what we could do with, with this system would be amazing. We're gonna use this to make, hold vaccines that, whatever temperature we like. So those proteins have a complicated job. This is a complicated slide. I'm just showing you on the right here that people have gone to such lengths now as to do X-ray computerized tomography on tardigrades and map every single structure. And the things I wanted to show you are these little blobs here. These little blobs here are storage granules that hold lipids, they hold proteins, and this is them under a normal microscope. It's quite a yellow tardigrade. They have, these cryoprotectors have a flipping complicated job to do. It's not just a matter of stopping ice crystals forming. There's multiple sorts of neurons. Um, there's, there's gut cells, there's malpighian tubules, there's salivary glands, all sorts of things have to be saved. So how do they do it? So kind of want to finish this part off by telling you how we can do it. And then we can have a drink. I've got my cup of tea already. You're probably dying for your cup of tea this time of night. So I want to go through the mechanisms by which they, they save this. The first one is a protein, which is probably the most amazing piece of science I can remember. I think this one broke the scientific internet when it was published four years ago. But one of the proteins they found was responsible for the ability 
to protect the tardigrades from uh, x-rays. Now this was found on a Japanese street in some moss in the crack on a pavement. Yeah. So they found the tardigrade that was really resistant to ionizing radiation. So they'd seen what people had done in space 10 years ago. They went to the pavement, they dug up some, just to have a look at what was there. They found this tardigrade, decided for whatever reason to irradiate it. And then they kept irradiating it and they couldn't kill it. And they, this, this tardigrade should die. Um, because x-rays cause double-stranded breaks in DNA. And any time you do that, you're in for bad news because DNA tries to repair itself. And when it gets it wrong, it gets it wrong big time and it can cause you things like cancer. So people are very interested in protecting from ionizing radiation. And this amazing protein they found, DSAP, it doesn't exist in any other organism. We've not found homologs in anything else, only in tardigrades. It's like it's come from outer space itself because this protein wraps around. Now, if you know the structure of DNA, you'll re probably remember it's a helix and it's wound around histone proteins and nucleosomes. And the DSAP protein winds itself around the nucleosomes to form a protective barrier, which has just been reported a few months ago now, the actual structure of these proteins. They literally form a cage around the DNA to protect it. It's just extraordinary. But the reason it broke the internet was because these two Japanese scientists found that they cloned the gene that encoded the DSAP protein. And they took that DSAP protein, laid, crossed, transfected it into human cells. And those human cells became a thousand times more resistant to x-rays than they were without the tardigrade gene. Which is pretty scary. You know, I'm not sure I want to be made transgenic to make myself into a human X-man that can res resist um, x-rays, but that's kind of the implication. The thing to think about, if we're ever, you know, we've just been marvelling at this flipping lander landing on Mars. If we're ever going to go to Mars and back, we will get a lethal dose of cosmic rays. So how are you going to protect yourself? Are you going to line your spaceship with lead? What are you going to do? Are you going to send transgenic astronauts? So interesting ecological, theological questions to do um, with what you're going to do. Last one. This was published last year, October last year. Another example, a scientist decided he wanted to know why tardigrades were so resistant to ultraviolet light. So what he did was he went to the, a wall opposite his lab, which had the sun on it all day, and he found some tardigrades. And what he found was this tardigrade, when you shone ultraviolet light at it, it fluoresced back blue. And it's a sunscreen. Yeah. It's actually taking the energy of the ultraviolet light and changing that energy to reactivate photons in the blue. So it's a, it's it's a protective uh, fluorescent mechanism that these tardigrades have developed. We know that it's a sunscreen. We know that he can give this fluorescent pigment to other organisms and they will protect their skin. What we don't know is anything about the product. We don't know how it works. We don't know what sort of molecule it is. That seems to be a big secret at the moment because somebody's working on it somewhere. Just wanna finish talking. I've talked about Arizona, I've talked about the moon, <laughs> but actually this is a picture of a tardigrade from Brandon Marsh. Yeah, they're everywhere. So there's, it's not a very good picture. It's just about one of the first pictures I took. It's one of the kids on the day, had a bucket of water from that little educational pond dip place. We went, we filtered it through a, a 40 micron filter threw the contents on and then there was these these are, are quite a pigmented and actually this is rhizobiotis um i can tell it's rhizobiotis because of this shape of the, the pharyngeal muscle here and the number of placoids it has and the claws which you can't see in this picture and its pigmentation so it tells me the species uh, and it's one of the ones that's really resistant to um, x-ray radiation so it's quite a cool species um but this is my garage roof so I was out there today. This is this is an ecological site. I'm quite interested to actually do. I think I might do a final year project at university on this because this side of the roof gets very little sun, and this side is exposed to UV all day. So I want to know. I should be looking at the the populations either side of the roof. I've done an experiment of of one. I've looked at two tardigrades that I found, and I don't know what the species is, but uh, you can have it. Oh, let me um, change my laser pen to my pointer, and you can see. This is on the dark side of the roof. I don't know if you're getting, getting that video through. It's quite an active species. I've never seen one. And it's kind of forcing its way around underneath 
that's probably a piece of plastic from the air, that, that thing there. You can watch it say legs go, you can see it's mid gut, you can see it's stylets. Can you just see the eye spot? Oh, it's squeezing under there. Yep, there we go. Yep, I can get there. Oh yeah, now we're through. And off he goes. He's quite quite an active tardigrade. On the sunny side of the roof. Whoop. On the sunny side of the roof. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can't get both these to go at once. Oh. Right, on the sunny side of the roof is the Hethera tardigrader, uh, Alicinus. This is the one that if you can see behind me, if you can see my picture, if I go this way, this is the same species as my as my um, my screensaver behind me. My screensaver's on to stop you showing showing you my son's messy bedroom that I'm sitting in to broadcast this. A beautiful tardigrade. You can see there are four claws all in a line on the, each of the legs. This one, you can also see that the posterior pair, set of legs are almost set out independently of the other six. In that the, the other six often walk on the substrate and the other two are almost back up in the air. So they're clinging around to things. It's quite an extraordinary animal. So, time to go forward now. And how do you find them? Well, actually, they're really relatively easy, although I'm really struggling tonight and we'll have a cup of tea and then see if I can find some live in a minute. So the classic one is to go to a, a wood, collect some lichen, collect some moss, put them in a small bucket, fill them with mineral water. Um, online it always says use Volvic. Um, I've used, um, what do I use today? Oh. Other mineral waters are available. I've used some, uh, Evian, I think this is. Oh, it's not it's coming through. It's being masked off the screen. Other mineral waters are available. I'm using another French mineral water. <laughs> not that it's any better, and it's certainly not working this evening. But um, effectively, what I do is I you soak it usually for about four hours, um, and little puddles of moss. You don't need very much. Just a pinch in a little petri dish. Said petri dish like this. Squeeze, and you end up. With a, I've got a slightly larger petri dish with mud in it and then you search and that search can take between 10 seconds and half a day. <laughs> so, biology is a cruel mistress and she doesn't always play the game so I've got I've shown you those videos but um, I can show you a few more but we can have a go at doing some live microscopy in a minute. So my final picture is to show you what looks it's one of the ideas of the interest, my interest, my research interests are to look inside the tardigrade here. So I'm, I'm kind of saying to you that this looks a mic like a micro pig in space. Yeah. It's not actually, it's down a confocal microscope for anybody who wants to know what that is. And here's, you can just see the outline of the tardigrade here. You can see the stylet, the esophagus, and going down to the mid gut. And the red here is algae. That's the red from chlorophyll uh, fluorescing. The green, is actually bacteria. We've actually taken some uh, transgenic bacteria transformed with a green fluorescent protein and we've been feeding it, seeing if the tardigrade would eat the bacteria for a typical, a certain, we, I was actually doing a defecation experiment, see how it would pull it out at the time. But what this shows you is that the bacteria are here and, and stabilized in the gut along with the algae that it's eaten. We're quite interested in the microbiome. And we're just determining now whether the microbiome survives the tan state. Because if it does, and if tardigrades can survive on the moon, then one of the things they might protect is microbes. So this lander that's up on Mars, I'm pointing like I know Mars is over there. I don't actually, don't quite know where Mars is, it might be over there. Um, but we'll be intrigued, you know, if tardigrades, are they a vector for microbes in space? one of the my most favorite theories that's probably not true in the world but uh, i just love the idea that tardigrades are, are out there being tons moving uh, microbes in space and actually the reason they appear so amazingly in the in the evolutionary record with the cambrian is that's where they landed i don't believe that for a moment because i think there's much more ancient molecular evidence that tells us microbes have been here for three and a half billion years so but the, the idea is fanciful and i am interested in how the, the microbiome survives um ton formation um, in tardigrades at the moment.
Oh, oh, there's some action. Fast. Yeah, oh, it's just crawling off the screen in my... I might need to do that. It's beautifully round. That looks like a tardigrade egg. Oh, cool. It tells me they're here. <laughs> right. You can hey. see a you. There he is. I don't say he. <laughs> <laughs> That's really sexy. Oh. He's a he. I've got no evidence that he's a he at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so if everybody's back in the room, we've somehow managed to find a tardigrade. I can't say it's been easy, but I thought what I'm going to do is go through the reverse of the process. So at the moment, I've got an iPhone stuck to um, a compound light microscope. So I don't know if you remember from any of your biology training, if you've done at school or if you've done at university or college or anywhere, um, microscopes come in a few different types. You know, the most powerful ones are what we call in biology, the most powerful ones we use are called two photon microscopes. We use them to look, we can optically section material with photons and get them to fluoresce beautiful colors as I showed you that, that kind of space looking tardigrade in green and red at the end of the talk. Um, but for most of us who do things like histology or you uh, then you use a compound light microscope. Uh, so this is a compound light microscope and you can see this is a live tardigrade. I'm, I'm actually beaming this to you now. I've never done live microscopy before. I'm, first of all, I was mortified that I couldn't find a tardigrade. Now at least I, I showed you a tardigrade's bum and I've shown you a tardigrade hiding behind a piece of mud. So this is pretty impressive. What I quite like, it gives it some structure that it's actually walking across. So you can just see his legs. This is incredibly active. Can remember because Spallanzani called them slow stepper. And I'll show you why he called them slow stepper in a bit when we actually look at where I've taken it from. Um, but this is a pretty good view of a tardigrade. Uh, you can just see his little paws out, her little paws out. Gosh, kind of, can't, how can I be sexist over a tardigrade? I can't believe it, but I can manage to find that way to do that. Yeah, this, so this is, um, I'm just looking at my magnification now. I've got a, I've got a, a 10 times lens on. Um, I've got a 10 times eyepiece, so that's 100 times. This is 500 times magnification you're looking at now. So this tardigrade is probably only a maximum 0.3 of a millimeter across. Most of the time they eat, you know, where do they sit in the kind of the ecosystem services? They sit there and they eat bacteria they eat fungi, they eat plant material, they eat, oh, you can actually see it's actually swallowing something then. Or is that just, no, it's not, it's outside it. Yeah, you can see his hind legs, do you see how his hind legs are quite separated and, and can actually point completely the other way around to the other six legs. So the six legs can be down and the other two can be pointing up in the air. It's now gone right behind this piece of mud, hasn't it? And it's coming out the other side, it's, Yeah, that's quite cute. He's waving at you, saying bye, bye. <laughs> um, so this is this is a Utah degrade. I can't I can't do the species because I I need to hold it still to look at the um the shape of the esophagus and the number of placodes and the way the stylets work. But it's certainly a Utah degrade. It's not like Elenicius, the that kind of orange one that's behind me here in my in my my vision camera. You can I don't know if you can just see. I can't really show you. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Can you see my pointer at all? I don't know if that comes over. Does it come across? Yeah, we can see your pointer. Yeah. Can you just see? You can just see that black spot there. That's it. That's the eye spots. So they can see light. But they can't really see vision, um, but they can recognise light. We don't know if they have a circadian rhythm. We don't know if they got circadian genes. That'd be quite an interesting project that I just thought of right then. Wow, why don't I do that next week? I'm going to investigate the database. Oh, it's got its bum out now. I don't want to see its bum. It's hidden right behind there. Come out the other side. I quite like this. What I'm really looking for is to see the mouth parts. If you can see there in these stylets, there's a kind of triangle. Um, this the esophagus, I'm pointing at my throat here, but the esophagus muscle is incredibly powerful. It will project out the stylets through the mouth parts and pierce right through other cells, right through plant cells, which are pretty tough, moss, um, other tardigrades, rotifers, nematodes, um, all sorts of things. 
we've probably spent long enough looking at a piece of mud at 500 times the magnification with a tardigrade hiding behind it. Just thought I'd show you the rest of this apparatus. So I'm going to undo this and leave this tardigrade to enjoy its evening. Um, so actually, while I've got this here, I could show you what I'm set up. So this is effectively, uh, this is the 10 times objective. It's coming up, this is, these are 10 times eyepieces. This was just clamped onto here to look at it. And this is a standard um, teaching size microscope. Um, um, that's, that's the camera looking at itself. So, yeah, let me take you through this part. So on this side of my, my, my son's desk, I have um, a stereo dissecting scope. So I think Julia was telling me earlier, you typed um, earthworms. Yeah, you had to look at the species of earthworms. So you would have used this type of microscope. This is a pretty rubbish, one I've got is uh, not a very good one. This only has a one times and a three times. It doesn't, I can't move up and down zoom. But you can see that what I've done is I have a tray of mud yeah, from moss. So what I've done is, um, this was from a takeaway. So I have my takeaway and then I eat the takeaway. That's the important part. And then for the rest of it, once you've cleaned it out, I can use, I can just put um, moss. So this is just moss. And then I add some nice, you, maybe where it's going wrong is I've used Evian, but I'm meant to use Volvic water, they tell me. Volvic water is the best. Other mineral waters are available. As long as it hasn't got carbon dioxide in it, it works just fine. I didn't drink my cup of tea. Excuse me while I drink my cup of tea. Mine's gone cold. But you soak this, this the cooking is soak it for four hours, take it out and squeeze. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we're looking at here. Now, I don't know. I did have the iPad. I had an iPad separately beaming from this, but I'm just going to see if I can do this now. You can see so you can see the sort of field of view that I'm getting with this. Is that going to work on here? It's a different system. Let me just struggle a little bit and see if it's worth it. Yeah, you can sort of see what I'm looking at. Now it's harder on here to get this to work. What I want to do is to try and show you, I'm going to stop sharing this for a moment and use a different mechanism. I've never done so much technical stuff in my life before. What can you see now? Oh yeah, you can see. So here you can see me zooming into my, um, now this worked really beautifully when I practiced this. Now it's not going to work at all, is it? Here we go. Yeah, it's much easier if you have amphibians or reptiles. <laughs> Let me just see where the camera is. It's a bit low. Yeah, that's not bad, is it? Yeah, it's getting there. Oh, there's the field of view. Where it was there? Where's it gone? Oh, this is so frustrating. <laughs> Live microscopy. So when it's a bit like okay. trying to take a picture down the spotting scope if you're birding. It's a bit like that. Have you tried? Yes, that these clamps I was clamping onto the other um, microscope with are really good. I can hold that on a telescope or this or this. This system with the with the chemistry lab that I've got in here trying to do this really doesn't work at all. But I haven't got it. Let me just get this. Whoa. I think what's happening is it's actually Isabella was right to look at gas because um, it's moving. I don't know what you can see here. I'm going to try and hold still. Do you see it actually move? I mean, I know the edges are flicking, but can you see movement in there? So this is the debris from squeezed moss. It's probably the one of the most exciting things you can ever look at. <laughs> I'm not seeing what I want to see here, to be honest. I'm going to come out and I'm going to go to one times. That's a better view. This is the field of view you get. This is tardigrade hunting country. Yeah. And what you have to do is find something about the size of that thing there. See that little bit there? If you can see my pointer, that's where I'm looking for. 
it's a big world out there in that pot of and so what i spend most of my time doing is looking for movement okay so i'm going to try and move this around and see what see if we can get somewhere that's so i'm going to move this through a field of view let it settle and look for movement what i see is painfully nothing move and I, what, what i'm trying to show you is the rotifers and the nematodes are moving there's something busily moving to the right of the screen there. <laughs> this is just completely static. I want something a fast twitch. Well, there it is. There, there it is. There. So up, if this field of view here, there's something going on up here. Can you just see this move? This is not a tardigrade. You can just see something moving here. It's almost invisible. It's like a piece of string moving. So if when you're birding, it's that little thing in the corner of your, your vision that you see move. It's that little brown thing you're never ever going to spot and identify. The L. This is a nematode. This is a roundworm. This is the most abundant multicellular organism on the earth. There are 10,000 of them in every square centimetre of mud. There's more of these multicellular organs than anything else, yet yeah, I can hardly see it. It's completely invisible. The tardigrade is going to be about this big. Yeah. So I'm actually looking for really slow movement. So I scan this field of view for really slow movement. And then I go in with this, okay? A micro pipette. So you, maybe you've, you've used one at university to measure samples or biology. So I'm going to go in here. I'm just going to see if I can actually see myself do it. Oh, I can. And I'm going to pick up a sample. And I transfer that sample to a microscope slide. And then we look down the, down the microscope and we find tardigrades if we're lucky. Yep. So we have been lucky in part tonight because I couldn't find one when I was looking, but I managed to find one when I actually down the compound scope, which is completely the wrong way to do it. But I'm not going to knock serendipity. <laughs> so that's really all I want to say tonight. I've, I hope what I've done is, if you can remember nothing about tardigrades, I honestly don't mind. Yeah, you know? I'm not going to test you. I want to know you. There are biologists. There is a most amazing Spanish school teacher called Rafael Martin Lido who takes the world's best photographs of tardigrades. If you get a chance to look at his Twitter feed or his Instagram, Martin, uh, Rafael Martin Lido, he takes the most amazing pictures of marine plankton. And amongst those are the tardigrade, the marine tardigrades. They are incredible, yeah. I've asked him many times for advice how to capture, um, just collect marine tardigrades. His, his pictures are just beautiful. Um, and they're freely available on Twitter or, or it's, I think he's got a Facebook site, but he's definitely got Instagram as well. Um, have a look for him. I hope what you can take home is that there are people who are madly enthusiastic about these organisms because of their involvement in, in extreme environments, because you can put them on a space station, because you can freeze them to minus 272 degrees centigrade to almost absolute zero. You can cook them at 150 degrees and the tons survive. You can dehydrate them for at least 30 years, maybe over 100 years. Um, I went to the Warwickshire Museum and asked if I could go to the herbarium and take some moss and chew it up because they've got a fantastic herbarium in the Warwickshire Museum. Uh, they said no, <laughs> disappointed. But then after my exposition tonight of looking in live moss, maybe they had a point that I can't always find them. Um, but they have collections of moss that go back over 170 years and we could get a world record, but they, uh, that, uh, the uh, what's the guy called? Um, he has that beautiful title. He's called uh, the curator, is it the curator of natural history of Warwickshire or something like that? It's a beautiful, so a fantastic name, um, fantastic title, um, and a fantastic collection they have there. Uh, and then you have great sites at Brandon Marsh. And if if um, Deborah or anybody else wants to invite me to come and actually live take the microscopes, I will take a culture of tardigrades, so you definitely will see tardigrades. <laughs> and we can go searching in the ponds. We're not always allowed to, we have to ask special permission. Thanks for the opportunity for digging around on my roof. And uh, you can see it, it's just there. It's a beautiful organism. Um, and I've got them on my garage roof and probably so have you, if you can look.
I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was great. It was really um, cool to see one live. Um, thank you for, <laughs> for demoing that, for persevering in finding one for us to see. Um, does anyone have any particular questions for Kevin? Go for it. Just, yeah, unmute yourselves. Yeah, far away. Anything at all about, because I'm a, I'm a relative newbie at tardigrade hunting. Um, so if you want to know how I got into this or... I am a member of the Warwickshire Wildlife. Uh, just to say, <laughs> I do belong here. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> Hi, could I ask a question? Oh, Go Sally's asking it. something. Yes, of course you can. Sorry. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, um, I was just wondering, or well, I was like re really interested in how they are so um, like bomb proof with all of those adaptions. Is there any idea what selection pressure or multiple selection pressures has caused that? Because you said they're found in crevices on streets and things and they're not exposed to x-rays there really, I suppose, or um, freezing at low temperatures and things. Yeah, good question, Becca. Um, so the answer is the organisms are completely under-researched. Yeah. So it is like we're just it's not like we haven't known these things for 250 years are there. And like um, even things like brine shrimp, you know, we know we can do things to them and they come back to life. But it's only really now, I think, as we've come to this idea of kind of this minuscule level of biology, was how does that work? How does that work? And then to ask the pressure of what niche they live in and why it's the pressure that drives them to that niche. And I often wonder that question. I'm blithering about it because I don't know the answer, to be truthful. But two things I can say about it. One is they're very rarely the dominant organism in a, in a niche. They, they always share their niches with two other organisms and that is they're always present rotifers and nematodes. Nematodes seem to win most of the time but there are only there are occasions where the tardigrades win and that's why I was talking about criconite holes in glaciers where these tardigrades are often the dominant species. So what's the pressure there? I would say the pressure there is multiple pressures. You have high altitude, you have high incidence of radiation and you have low temperature. So you have three sets of at least three that I can think of off the top of my head. On a Japanese pavement, <laughs> well, it's the selection pressure is probably gonna be radiation, ultraviolet radiation. That's gonna be the big drive. Um, and you do find them in, I mean, the, the moss I've taken them from today is sitting on a garage roof. And for half of the day, it sits in baking sun in the summer. Yeah. So it literally my, my roof points um, almost due, sort of due, um, which way is that? North, it's about, it points sort of southeast, a little more east. So it's kind of gets, the sunrise in the morning, not too bad, but then radiation builds at midday and then it's radiated all afternoon. So I think radiation is the big pressure, but the fact that they exist over from the equator to the poles, you find them in the Arctic, you find them in the Antarctic. Um, and that's where the, so what's the pressures down there? I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know. Um, wherever there's algae to eat, there'll be an organism that eats them. Yeah, I, I guess that's the point. That could be, um, nematodes it can be rotifers it can be tardigrades tardigrades have advantages that nematodes probably don't have yeah nematodes are more susceptible to radiation though they can go under undergo anhydrobiosis they can form a thing called a dower stage where they can kind of reproductively kind of halt themselves and then re-enter the life cycle at a different stage so they can skip part of their life cycle if required under stress rotifers certainly can undergo anhydrobiosis but i'm not sure that anybody's looked at them in terms of radiation resistance from the genome the chinese are busily sequencing every genome we don't see these genes products in any other organism 40 percent of their genes are just unknown to us what they do and i find that yeah i grew up as a molecular biologist and that blows my mind yeah <laughs> i go what are we what is what <laughs> so i get really excited um by the thoughts of all the new things that can be done. I thought the last year, the guy in India, he came, he'd been a postdoc in America, had come back to set his own lab up. And the first thing he does is look across the wall and scrapes the moss off his wall. And that's his, and that's what's running his lab now. It's mad. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's fantastic. Yeah. 
Sorry, um, I've got overly enthusiastic reply to you, Becca. No, and thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. I didn't know anything about tardigrades. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you got some. At least you remember how cute they are. Um, uh, Sally, can I? Am I looking on the on the on, chat? Yeah, the I was chat. just going to say. So Sally had asked a question when they sent the tardigrades into space. What um, it was? It was. Oh, there were two species. Razabiotis is one of the ones that comes to my head. Sally, there's another one that I can't remember. Um, and not all tardigrades are radiation resistant, that's for sure. So the, the, the type species is one called, they ha, none of them have common names, they all, they all contain um, Linnaean classification names. So the common species that we used for years was called Hypsobyssus duodini, and it's now changed its name to Hypsobyssus exemplaris as the exemplar member of the species. That is not resistant to radiation at all. So it's actually used as a control in their experiments because it's a, a Razobiotis species that they, they, one of the species, there's one beginning with P that I can't remember the name of that they put into space as well. It'd be easy to Google it. Um, but they're not all radiation resistant. So it's not true that when you see in the Daily Mail that all tardigrades can be resistant to everything, they're not, yeah. Hypsobyssus, we, my students can kill it really very easily. For the most robust animal on the planet, it seems to die really easy. <laughs> and that's if you just dehydrate it too fast. They're always looking to, we're looking, we often looking to look at the microbiome inside them uh, and they dehydrate them and then the, the, the tardigrades just die and then everything dies. <laughs> so, sure. I don't, okay. Sally, does that answer your question? I can't see Sally in the chat, but. I think Sally's having some internet issues, so um, that's why she's in the chat. Um, oh, you can see that later. Um, Ailis has, has asked, could you recommend a reasonable microscope for home use? Um, I'm just fortunate, Ayla, and, and I, um, I think what I would do is there's one called a foldoscope. These, these made of cardboard with a lens in. A foldoscope, but anything you can adapt to put, um, if you have a mobile phone and you can get an adapter, yeah, there's a pretty expensive mobile phone. I had to pay for that one, unfortunately. The university wouldn't buy me one. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm sure I essentially need a mobile phone. Um, uh, my phone's on a contract, but um, just because they pay me too much money at university, that's what that is. Yeah, any mobile phone. The cameras on these mobile phones are so much better than any other camera I've ever used. I don't know about you guys. I've paid between five and 10,000 pounds for research cameras and microscopes. Well, the microscopes in the research labs are worth 20,000 pounds plus. The camera, they'll sell me for 5,000 pounds and they're rubbish. And now what I do is I take my phone and I stick it to the camera, I stick it up to the microscope. They're beautiful resolution. I use it for all my histology with the students. I use it for all my tardigrade work. Can I recommend it? I would, I haven't got a name. I'm not, I'm not part of a company selling them. Yeah, a Zeiss microscope, like I'm showing you, a Primo Star is a is a teaching microscope. It's probably worth about a thousand pounds. I would suggest looking at something like secondhand and old, because old microscopes have better optics. Yeah, they have lots of engineering and lots of old optics. The problem with old microscopes is the um, the mechanics. Mechanics wear out. So the mechanics on the, the Primo Star are really fantastic, but they, they, they give me cheap lenses. You know, they don't have all the, the lenses they could have if you were using it properly. Um, so those old, th I'm trying to think of the names of them. Forgive me, uh, Ailey, I can't think what they're called. I think I would go and look for old secondhand microscopes that I could stick down on my, my mobile phone is what I would do. You'll probably pay one or 200 pounds expensive yeah um folder scopes 50 quid maybe t maybe 20 quid <laughs> they have rubbish lenses in but if you can adapt it with your um if you look at target there's a there's an article online where somebody's used folder scopes to look at tardigrades they're probably not as good as the pictures i've shown you tonight but um they're they're all right you can you can see things um and you will see things you, and you can anything that you can attach a mobile phone to you can use you know you'll have five times magnification on a samsung you might have something better because the cameras on my son, son samsung are fantastic better than my iphone so yeah so buy cheap put a mobile phone on it. <laughs> it the more you can spend you get what you pay for the more you can spend and you you know we're in the research labs we would spend 
a frightening amount of money because of course we, we apply for a grant and somebody else pays and then we'll, we'll pay 20,000 pounds easily, which is, I, you know, my microscopes are worth more than my car <laughs> at work. Here on teaching microscopes, they're about the same price as the rubbish cars I drive, so. <laughs> I don't know if that helps you, but I can't, I'm not gonna be able to recommend one, but have a look at a folder scope. Um, the other ones you can look at, if you, there's a guy called Orkin Sawyer, who has got um, some plans, and they may be actually out in the public domain to make um, 3D printable microscopes. You, if you have access to a 3D printer anywhere, he, he has the plans to be able to print them. So have a look online for 3D printing, because you don't need all the facilities of a, you don't need phase contrast microscopy, you don't need digital interference contrast microscopy, you just need light and a lens, a good lens, a light. And if you could put that inside a piece of plastic that you could print, it might cost you. The printer would be a lot of money, but the, the, the Fab Lab in Coventry, you know, the Fab Lab in the middle of Coventry, I don't know if they're ever elsewhere in the country, they might have those sorts of facilities to print for young people. Um, I was just wondering, why do you think they have been so under-researched, considering they're quite a unique piece of the world you know yeah um so um i think the answer is uh low-hanging fruit is my answer to that one it's easier to study the things you can study isn't it um so why does any organism become what we call a model organism yeah so in the if i pick um an amphibian because you've just done amphibians then the model organism to study amphibians is an amphibian called xenopus levis south african clawed toad why do people use the clawed toad? Um, because it lays eggs external to the body so I can follow development without having to cut open a mouse or a human to look at the developing embryo. I can watch this vertebrate develop from an egg um, and then I can learn to dissect it and then I can transplant bits from one bit of the egg to the other. So I can do lots of complex biology. If I want to do genetics, why did a fruit fly get chosen? Yeah. And that's because Thomas Morgan um, was interested in evolution. He wanted to watch evolution in the lab. So he just brought everything into the lab. And the only thing he could keep that actually had a generation that he could keep watching was a fruit fly. So he studied fruit flies. And then we started, discovered the chromosomal theory of inheritance from that. And then we discovered how transposons work. And then we discovered development and genetics and blah, blah. And it's tortured our life ever since. <laughs> so why tardigrades? The only reason we study tardigrades, I think, is because we can't, we couldn't study tardigrades, it's because they're so small. You've seen the difficulty I've had tonight. You know, if you have a reptile or a snake guy, he's going to have a frog in a box, or he's going to have a snake that he can handle or she can handle. Whereas I've had to dig around in the mud. And <laughs> so it's just intrinsically harder to, harder to handle. It doesn't mean they're biologically less interesting. You know, do they, do they, you know, and do they, it's not obvious that they commit, um, they're a keystone species or that they have a really you know, a, a kind of environmental service angle to them. It's not obvious what that is because lots of other organisms can replace that niche and that role in the niche. So I think the drive for me is this amazing kind of biology that people are discovering and on how different they are to other animals. Yeah. So there are, there, are, there are people that truly believe that on the moon and on Mars, there are tardigrades. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think there are personally, <laughs> but I'm not convinced. But uh, you know, I'm, if they are, because they believe in this theory of panspermia, that microbial life didn't evolve here, as most of us probably consider the evidence is, but they believe that microbes came from outer space and they arrived in something. And they, some people think they arrived inside tardigrades, yeah. <laughs> Which would be a lovely thought, but I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I wouldn't put my mortgage on it. I'd like to keep my bets open for that one. I don't know if that answers your question really, Julia, but it's no, a nice it is. about why they, why are they organisms that we study. Yeah. yeah, if you had to choose one of them then, of your tardigrades, which one would you make your model? Um, which one's the easiest to find? Oh, so, yeah, so, well, actually, I would make one called um, Macrobiotus, uh, Macrobiotus, because it lays and beautiful tons that are black, black tons um 
and they're quite nice to do experiments on because I can count them a, 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 under a dissecting microscope. I don't have to use a fancy one. I can just look at a plate and count how many black spots there are. And so I can give it different conditions and see how stressed it is. So I, um, uh, dactylobiotis, dactyl, dactyl yeah, that's what it's called. You can buy them. Yeah, there's a company in Manchester, for anybody who's in Manchester, um, there's a company called Sciento, and they sell three different species of tardigrades. Hypsobiscus, which is flipping useless, um, <laughs> which is the exemplar species, so we often use it for controls, but they sell Dactylobiotis as well. Um, that's a really cool species. It's quite a big tardigrade, over a millimetre long sometimes as well, so they're larger. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to Amsterdam, but I found the Micropia Museum really interesting if anyone's been there. It's uh, attached to the zoo. Um, there's a bit about tardigrades there. I'd recommend that if you ever go abroad again um, <laughs> and then happen to, to go there. Um, any last questions for Kevin before we finish up? Um, I don't know if I'm like asking a really broad, large question, but you said something about how they trans they are able to get like genes from other organisms. This were a really gene question. transfer, yeah. But I'm just wondering, can other arthropods do that? Why not other arthropods do that? Yeah, so we don't know that. I mean, yes, I think the answer to that is yes, they can. Yeah, um, they're not the only organism that can do it. Uh, they do it to a larger extent than most things that's all so we can look in the genome of many arthropods i mean i know the one for fruit flies and we can see horizontal gene transfer coming in from other species that you can't that it's not just evolved there so you there are molecular ways to define horizontal dna from horizontal gene transfer um, they're moved by viruses by transposons um all unless you've got a background in molecular biology i'm you might have because I don't know what this audience is really. Uh, there's, there's ways of DNA can be quite mobile. Yeah, DNA will find a way. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Right, it's a good question. It's been really lovely talking to you all. I hope the rest of the course is, is fantastic. Um, and they show you more animals than just the one tardigrade that I was able to show you. <laughs> I think everyone was very excited by the one tardigrade. I, I was excited. Yeah, we were, we were all very excited. Thank you so much for your time and for giving us such a, a great engaging talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that everyone enjoyed something a little bit different.